Julius Robert Oppenheimer, known to history as Robert Oppenheimer, was born on April 22, 1904 in New York City. He gained recognition by his middle name and is commonly referred to as Robert Oppenheimer or J. Robert Oppenheimer today. Coming from a prosperous Jewish family in New York City, his father Julius had emigrated from Germany to the United States in 1888, seeking refuge from the growing anti-Semitism in Europe. Despite starting with little wealth, Julius thrived in America and eventually became a successful executive in the textile industry. Robert's mother, Ella Friedman, also of Jewish heritage, was an artist who influenced his perspective on the structure of existence and the universe. Ella and Julius had another son named Frank, who followed in Robert's footsteps and became a physicist. Growing up in privilege, Robert had a privileged upbringing. In the early 1910s, Robert's family moved into a spacious apartment on West 88th Street in Manhattan, which was one of the most affluent areas of New York City at the time. His father had already established himself as a prominent figure in the city's business circles by then. The apartment was adorned with original works by renowned artists such as Vincent van Gogh and Pablo Picasso. Robert attended some of the best educational institutions in New York, including the Ethical Culture School and the Alcuin Preparatory School. He developed an interest in mineralogy at a young age, which led to his admission to the Mineralogical Club of New York City when he was just 11 years old. Robert's academic prowess was evident throughout his secondary school years, and he completed his education at Alcuin in a year and a half less than the standard time. Although he initially intended to study chemistry at Harvard University, he eventually switched to physics, which would become his true calling in the years to come. During his time at America's oldest college, he was profoundly influenced by Professor Percy Bridgman, an experimental physicist on the faculty at Harvard during that period. This era also witnessed students at Harvard and other prestigious American universities studying a wide range of subjects, including history and the Greek and Latin classics, which remained integral to many Western curricula in the 1920s. Looking back on his Harvard years later in life, Oppenheimer acknowledged that he dedicated most of his time to the library, immersing himself in extensive reading. He even attended more classes than required. As a result, Oppenheimer graduated with a Bachelor of Arts summa cum laude in 1925, completing the distinction in just three years instead of the usual four, following a trend he had established. Even before his graduation, Oppenheimer had already been accepted to pursue further studies at Cambridge University in England. At that time, Cambridge was renowned as a leading center for physics research a reputation it had cultivated since the days of Isaac Newton in the late 17th century. Oppenheimer's year at Cambridge, from the fall of 1925 to the summer of 1926, played a significant role in his intellectual growth, as he was exposed to the teachings of Lord Ernest Rutherford, a physicist from New Zealand who is widely regarded as the father of nuclear physics today. For instance, Rutherford was the first to discover and explain the concept of nuclear half-life and the associated radiation, which earned him the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1908. Oppenheimer, towards the end of his first year at Cambridge, caught the attention of European physicists with his remarkable abilities. He then accepted an offer from Max Born, a German physicist, to study at the University of Göttingen in Germany, which was renowned as one of Europe's leading centers of education. During his time in Göttingen, Oppenheimer had the opportunity to study alongside future giants of theoretical physics such as Werner Heisenberg, Enrico Fermi, and Edward Teller. Interestingly, Oppenheimer completed his Ph.D. in physics in the spring of 1927, less than a year after arriving in Göttingen. James Frank, the internal examiner who had previously won the Nobel Prize for Physics, expressed relief after Oppenheimer's oral examination, stating that he had easily defended his doctoral work and was ready to challenge Frank himself. The exceptional potential that Oppenheimer displayed as a theoretical physicist was evident in a paper he co-authored with Born in 1927, titled Quantum Theory of Molecules, which introduced the now famous Born-Oppenheimer approximation. The field of molecular dynamics deals with the movement and interaction of molecules. Born and Oppenheimer's approximation demonstrated that the wave functions of electrons and nuclei in a molecule 
are different due to the significant difference in their masses. As a result, the coordinates of the heavier nuclei are relatively fixed, while the lighter electrons are more dynamic and influenced by wave functions. Oppenheimer's interest in both chemistry and physics played a significant role in developing the theory that combined elements of quantum chemistry and molecular physics. The approximation was crucial in enabling scientists to separate the motion of nuclei and electrons from the late 1920s onwards. Oppenheimer, who obtained his Ph.D. from Göttingen and worked with Max Born, was an intriguing figure. He was a mix of a reserved scientist and a relatively cheerful person, shifting from introversion to extroversion as needed or as his mood dictated. He was a chain smoker, and his lifelong habit of smoking contributed significantly to his untimely death in his early 60s. During his time at Harvard, Cambridge, and Göttingen, those who were acquainted with him remembered him as a peculiar blend of intelligence and occasional naivety. He often made unwise judgments and decisions and tended to exaggerate. As time passed, he developed a sense of arrogance, but this was balanced by his intellectual generosity towards his colleagues and students in later years. One notable aspect of his character was his fascination with Eastern philosophy and mysticism. He displayed a particular interest in Hinduism and Confucianism, even going as far as learning Sanskrit, the sacred language of Hinduism, to read the ancient texts of this faith in their original form. His interest in religion and mysticism was not a mere eccentric hobby. Oppenheimer viewed the study of physics as a gateway to comprehending the mystical essence of the universe and its existence. His broader intellectual perspective was driven by a genuine curiosity rather than a strict pursuit of empirical scientific data. However, it is important to note that Oppenheimer also exhibited an unstable and unpredictable side. Oppenheimer's conduct during his time at Harvard was occasionally called into question by both his peers and instructors. In 1926, while studying at Cambridge, he supposedly tainted an apple with harmful chemicals and left it in his tutor Patrick Blackett's office. This act, along with potentially others, resulted in a brief threat of suspension from his studies at Cambridge. One of Oppenheimer's close friends in the 1920s, Francis Ferguson, who later became a renowned theorist of stage performance and drama, alleged that Oppenheimer physically assaulted him and attempted to strangle him when he revealed his engagement. Beneath all of this erratic behavior lay a peculiar combination of extreme arrogance and frequent falling out with numerous colleagues. Yet many biographers have concluded that Oppenheimer was also deeply insecure. This insecurity may have stemmed from his status as the son of a German-Jewish immigrant to America during a time when anti-Semitism was prevalent throughout the Western world. He consistently felt like an outsider and was known to suffer from bouts of depression. In essence, Oppenheimer remained somewhat of a mystery. After completing his studies at Göttingen and publishing additional research papers from his work in England and Germany, Oppenheimer returned to the United States. He briefly held fellowships at Harvard and the California Institute of Technology, with intermittent visits to Europe to work at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands and Zurich in Switzerland. It was in Leiden that he acquired the nickname Oppie, derived from a Dutch version of his name. In 1929, Oppenheimer permanently settled back in America after receiving numerous jobs offers from U.S. universities. He accepted two positions and became an associate professor in physics at both the University of California at Berkeley and the California Institute of Technology, Caltech. From 1929 to 1942, he held positions at both institutions, teaching at Berkeley during the fall and winter semesters and lecturing at Caltech in Pasadena during the spring term. Oppenheimer's teaching methods gained him fame within the physics community in the United States during the 1930s. He founded the School of Theoretical Physics at Berkeley and Caltech, where some of the finest physicists of the mid-20th century in America trained under him. During that time, Oppenheimer typically had a group of around 12 advanced graduate students and research fellows who collaborated closely with him on significant inquiries in the field of theoretical physics. In the busier periods of the academic term, they would frequently convene for daily meetings, during which Oppenheimer would assess their progress and provide them with valuable suggestions. 
According to various biographers who were acquainted with him during those days, Oppenheimer had a remarkable ability to inspire those he taught, instilling in them the belief that they were at the forefront of addressing some of humanity's most crucial questions at that time. However, the academic atmosphere was diverse, and when they were not engrossed in physics discussions, Oppenheimer and his colleagues could often be found engrossed in reading Plato's original Greek texts or studying Sanskrit. Hans Bethe, who had personal knowledge of Oppenheimer during this period, later recalled that Robert seemed somewhat detached from the outside world in the late 1920s and 1930s in California, only becoming aware of the Wall Street crash of 1929, several months after it had occurred. Impressive scientific advancements were achieved by Oppenheimer and his students at Berkeley and Caltech during the 1930s. For example, in 1930, Oppenheimer authored a paper that effectively predicted the existence of the positron or anti-electron as the anti-particle of the electron, although its existence was not definitively proven until 1932 by Carl David Anderson, a student who collaborated with Oppenheimer at Caltech. Oppenheimer collaborated closely with Wendell Furry to develop a contemporary understanding of the electron-positron theory and their mutual interactions. However, his most significant contribution came in partnership with Melba Phillips, one of his earliest doctoral students, during a time when female physicists were scarce in the United States. In 1935, they proposed the Oppenheimer-Phillips process, which involved a deuteron-induced nuclear reaction, where the neutron half of a deuteron fused with a target nucleus, resulting in the expulsion of a proton. This groundbreaking discovery demonstrated that certain elements could become radioactive when bombarded by deuterons, and that nuclear interactions could occur at lower energies than previously believed. These and numerous other breakthroughs made by Oppenheimer and his students at Berkeley and Caltech established California as a prominent hub for theoretical physics in the mid-20th century. Meanwhile, Oppenheimer's personal life was somewhat tumultuous during this period. He had been diagnosed with a mild case of tuberculosis in the late 1920s, prompting him to seek the dry desert air of Arizona and New Mexico. Eventually, he purchased a ranch in New Mexico. In the mid-1930s, Oppenheimer entered into a relationship with Jean Tatlock, a psychiatry student and the daughter of John Strong Tatlock, a renowned scholar in Old English and an expert on the life and works of Geoffrey Chaucer. Jean, who was ten years younger than Robert, was a troubled young woman struggling with severe depression and conflicting feelings about her sexuality. Despite their tumultuous relationship, they stayed together until 1940. During this time, Oppenheimer began seeing Kitty Harrison, a botanist and physicist at Caltech. Kitty divorced her second husband, Stuart Harrison, in November 1940 and married Robert the very next day. It is still unclear whether Oppenheimer continued to have occasional encounters with Tatlock in the early 1940s before her tragic suicide in January 1944. Robert and Kitty went on to have two children, a son named Peter, who was born in May 1941, and a daughter named Catherine, born in 1944. Oppenheimer's life, like that of countless individuals across Europe, North Africa, North America, and much of Asia, was greatly disrupted by the outbreak of the Second World War in the autumn of 1939. This conflict was a direct result of the rise of the Nazis in Germany under the leadership of Adolf Hitler in 1933. The Nazis, a fiercely anti-Semitic nationalist and fascist organization, aimed to oppress the Jewish people in Germany and initiate a new war in Europe to overturn the Treaty of Versailles. Their ultimate goal was to establish a German Third Reich or empire that would dominate the continent. Oppenheimer was well aware of the Nazis and their intentions. Being of Jewish descent himself, although not practicing, he became politically engaged for the first time in the mid-1930s. During this period, he started setting aside 3% of his salary to assist German Jews who were attempting to escape Germany due to the implementation of the anti-Jewish Nuremberg laws, which were introduced from 1934 onwards. The Nazi regime's anti-Jewish policies grew increasingly severe from 1936 onwards, particularly in 1938, as Germany began annexing neighboring countries, starting with Austria and then Czechoslovakia. Following the invasion of Poland in September 1939, Britain and France declared war on Germany. However, 
public opinion in the United States was not yet fully supportive of intervening in what was perceived as a European conflict. Consequently, America officially maintained a neutral stance for the first two years of the war, although President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's administration provided substantial support to Britain in the form of war materials from the very beginning of the war. The events of December 1941 would forever alter Oppenheimer's life and his place in history. At that time, the United States remained neutral in the Second World War, despite the dire situation in Europe, with the Nazis having already conquered Poland in the fall of 1939, followed by Denmark and Norway in the subsequent spring, and then the Low Countries and France in the summer of 1940. Germany's dominance in Europe seemed inevitable with the support of other states like Italy, Hungary, and Romania, as well as their invasions in North Africa and Russia. In this context, the Empire of Japan, driven by ultra-nationalism and the desire to establish an empire in Asia and the Pacific, launched a preemptive attack on the United States without a formal declaration of war. The attack on Pearl Harbor and other American territories on December 7, 1941, drew the United States into the Second World War, leading to their involvement in conflicts with Germany, Italy, and the Axis states. This resulted in the entire Northern Hemisphere being engulfed in war. Meanwhile, Oppenheimer quickly became a central figure in America's research efforts during the war. This was due to Nazi Germany's pursuit of a weapon of mass destruction to secure a swift victory. Germany, having been home to renowned scientists in the 1920s and 1930s, was well positioned to develop a nuclear weapon. The discovery of nuclear fission in Berlin in 1938 by Otto Robert Frisch and Lisa Meitner further fueled Germany's efforts. The Nazis conducted various experiments in the following years, including the development of a nuclear reactor and the exploration of heavy water as a means of producing an atomic weapon with research conducted in Nazi-occupied Norway throughout the war. In August 1939, President Roosevelt of Washington, D.C., received a letter from Hungarian nuclear physicists Leo Szilard and Albert Einstein, alerting the U.S. government to the threat posed by Nazi experiments. However, little action was taken in response to this letter in 1939 or 1940. It was only after the U.S. entered the war in late 1941 that serious consideration was given to initiating research in this field. The Los Alamos Laboratory during the Second World War was technically under the leadership of Oppenheimer, but it operated as part of the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project was a research and development program initiated by the U.S. government in 1942 with the primary goal of developing a nuclear bomb. The name Manhattan simply refers to the fact that the team's initial headquarters were located on the island of Manhattan in New York City, where they first convened in 1942. Over time, the project expanded and employed approximately 130,000 individuals across the country. These individuals worked on various aspects of the project in different states and regions. For example, a significant team based in Chicago, which included Oppenheimer's former colleagues Enrico Fermi and Leo Szilard, who co-authored the 1939 letter to Roosevelt, developed the first functional nuclear reactor there. In Washington State, another team at the Hanford site was assigned the task of producing plutonium from uranium, which would serve as a crucial material for any potential nuclear weapon. A similar project was also underway in Tennessee. Additionally, groups were operating under the umbrella of the Manhattan Project in Europe, engaged in espionage activities to uncover the Nazis' secret endeavors. Among all the research teams involved in the Manhattan Project, Oppenheimer would oversee the most vital one as the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico. Interestingly, Oppenheimer was almost not chosen for this position. The individual in charge of the Manhattan Project was Major General Leslie Groves, who oversaw the construction of the Pentagon as well, serving as the headquarters for the U.S. military and the Department of Defense. Although Groves is not widely recognized today, he holds the distinction of leading both the Manhattan Project responsible for the creation of the first nuclear weapon and the construction of the Pentagon. In 1942, Oppenheimer was recommended to Groves as a potential candidate to lead a team of theoretical physicists and scientists within the Manhattan Project. However, 
Groves initially had doubts and preferred someone who had received a Nobel Prize in physics, believing that such an individual would possess the necessary academic prestige to lead a team consisting of some of the most distinguished minds of that era. Oppenheimer's ability to bring out the best in his colleagues eventually convinced him. He reached out to Oppenheimer and, after conducting an interview, concluded that he was highly suitable for the position. In the ensuing weeks of early winter in 1942, Oppenheimer diligently searched for a suitable location to establish a research center. He sought a remote area, far from any urban centers, where secrecy could be maintained and nuclear weapon testing could be conducted when the time came. Eventually, he chose Los Alamos, New Mexico, and a research facility was constructed on the grounds of an old school. The University of California subcontracted through the War Department, oversaw this project, granting Oppenheimer a certain level of independence in terms of hiring and firing as the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory. While Oppenheimer initially expected a smaller workforce, the number of employees at Los Alamos exceeded 5,000 at its peak. Among the exceptional scientists he assembled at Los Alamos was John Hasbrook Van Vleck, a physicist and mathematician who had been at Harvard when Oppenheimer first arrived there in 1922. In 1977, he received the Nobel Prize for his groundbreaking research on electronic magnetism. Van Vleck played a crucial role in the development of the gun design utilized in the bombing of Hiroshima. Robert Serber, a colleague of Oppenheimer's from Berkeley, served as an organizing physicist at Los Alamos and was responsible for naming the bombs used in the initial test explosion and against Japan. These names, Thin Man, Little Boy, and Fat Man, were inspired by characters from detective movies and novels like The Maltese Falcon. Hans Bethe, a German-born theoretical physicist, later received the Nobel Prize in 1967. He played a pivotal role in calculating the critical mass of the bombs designed at Los Alamos. Edward Teller, a Hungarian-born Jew, was recruited to the Los Alamos laboratory. He had previously studied in Germany during the late 1920s, similar to Oppenheimer, before immigrating to the United States. Teller had already gained experience working at Fermi's reactor center in Chicago before being assigned to New Mexico. Teller was widely regarded as Oppenheimer's closest collaborator at Los Alamos. In addition to these individuals, there were numerous engineers, metallurgists, chemists, and military experts involved in the research teams at Los Alamos, focusing on various intricate aspects of constructing the first atomic weapon. The task faced by this team of physicists, engineers, and scientists was truly formidable. When they gathered at Los Alamos, their resources were limited to a theoretical understanding of how a nuclear chain reaction could be achieved. However, it is important to remember that Oppenheimer and his colleagues were not solely focused on constructing a nuclear weapon, but also on predicting the consequences of its detonation, especially in an era where we are aware of the devastating effects of a nuclear explosion. Consequently, extensive experimentation and theoretical speculation took place throughout 1943 and 1944. Oppenheimer, in particular, worked tirelessly, with his remarkable ability to quickly grasp the key aspects of any subject proving to be decisive. He immersed himself in every aspect of the work, rather than merely overseeing it from a distance. This level of involvement, both intellectually and physically, was maintained at each crucial stage. However, the demanding work schedule at Los Alamos took a toll on Oppenheimer's health. Although naturally slender, he lost an additional 20 pounds during his time in New Mexico, eventually weighing as little as 110 pounds or less than 8 stone. In 1943, research efforts at Los Alamos shifted towards a prototype known as Thin Man. This weapon, codenamed as such, was a plutonium gun type device that would function more like an artillery gun in terms of detonation rather than an implosion-type bomb. The logistical challenges involved in producing this were incredibly intricate. The polonium used in the initiator had to be sourced from Ontario, Canada, and then manufactured at a separate facility in Tennessee, which was also part of the wider Manhattan Project, or at the Hanford site in Washington State. However, the design issue posed an even greater complexity. For the gun-type weapon to function properly, the plutonium bullet inside the bomb 
had to be accelerated to a speed of 3,000 feet per second or over 3,200 kilometers per hour. Otherwise, the nuclear fission would initiate before the rest of the bomb's mechanics were ready for a successful explosion. This realization ultimately led to the abandonment of the Thin Man design in April 1944, as it was discovered that the required gun barrel size would be too large to fit into a B-29 flying superfortress, the newly designed heavy bombers intended for transporting nuclear bombs. Consequently, Oppenheimer reassigned many of the scientists and engineers who had been working on the Thin Man design to another project called Little Boy. Unlike the Thin Man, Little Boy was a simplified gun-type fission bomb that utilized uranium-235 instead of plutonium for the nuclear fission process. Concurrently, a third variant of design was being developed. Referred to as the Fat Man, this bomb would utilize plutonium and was designed as an implosion-type weapon. The team responsible for its development was led by Seth Nettermeyer, an American physicist. Despite the progress made on the Fat Man between 1943 and 1944, Oppenheimer still favored the gun-type design. However, his astute decision-making as the overseer at Los Alamos was evident when he brought John von Neumann, a Hungarian-born mathematician and physicist, to review the design in 1943. It was von Neumann who proposed a spherical shape and shaped charges, which would reduce the required amount of plutonium and enhance the feasibility of assembling an implosion-type bomb. In the subsequent months, metallurgists at Los Alamos faced the challenge of casting plutonium into a sphere. Eventually, they overcame this obstacle by devising a plutonium-gallium alloy that could be pressed into spheres and coated with nickel. The design process was nearing its conclusion. As 1945 began at Los Alamos, Oppenheimer's teams were approaching the final stages of completing both the Little Boy and Fat Man designs. As a result, there were two viable contenders for the successful construction of a nuclear weapon. Eventually, both projects reached completion around the same time. The design issues were resolved in the spring of 1945, and the necessary amounts of enriched uranium and plutonium were produced at the facilities in Washington State and Tennessee. These endeavors were massive undertakings considering the available technology during the Manhattan Project. Enriching these substances to become fissile materials in the mid-1940s was both highly expensive and time-consuming. Additionally, various engineering challenges needed to be addressed. For example, in 1944, the Fat Man bomb was being assembled with an impractical number of approximately 1,500 bolts. However, by the early summer of 1945, Oppenheimer's team managed to reduce this to just 90 bolts. Other technical concerns involved the bomb's descent when dropped from a height. Throughout 1944 and 1945, tests were conducted to evaluate the behavior of bombs like the Fat Man and Little Boy as they fell through the air. All these efforts culminated in the spring of 1945, and by midsummer, Oppenheimer informed Major General Leslie Groves the head of the Manhattan Project, that they were prepared to carry out a test detonation. The Trinity nuclear test took place on July 16, 1945, in the Jornada del Muerto Desert in New Mexico. Interestingly, the desert's name, translated from Spanish, means dead man's rote. In 1962, Oppenheimer communicated with Groves and disclosed that he had given the code name Trinity to the test. This choice of name was inspired by his reading of the religious poetry of John Donne, a 17th-century English poet, during the period when he came up with the name. The test itself involved the use of a plutonium-based implosion-type bomb, referred to as the Fat Man. However, for the test, this particular bomb was named the Gadget. To ensure the safety of the test, a highly remote and sparsely populated location was selected. This location was virtually isolated, with only one building present at the designated blast site, known as the McDonald Ranch House. Originally constructed by a German migrant in 1913, the McDonald family was forcibly evicted from the house in 1942 after the U.S. government took control of the region as part of the Manhattan Project. The test was meticulously planned, considering the exorbitant cost of producing the plutonium required which amounted to billions of dollars in today's currency. The processes involved in enriching uranium and plutonium at that time 
were extremely complex and demanding. The success of the test carried significant weight as Groves emphasized his reluctance to justify the detonation of billions of dollars worth of plutonium in the desert without a valid reason to a congressional committee. The Trinity test took place at dawn on July 16th. Observation shelters were set up in three different locations to the north, south, and west of the blast site, each approximately nine kilometers away from the detonation point. Protective goggles were provided to shield against harmful ultraviolet wavelengths, and the distance was deemed safe in terms of the radioactive half-life that would be generated. Many of the observers that morning were scientists, including Oppenheimer, Teller, Betha, Enrico Fermi, and John von Neumann. Some had doubts about the bomb's functionality, while others were concerned about its potential destructiveness. At 5.29 a.m., their questions were answered when the gadget exploded, releasing energy equivalent to 25,000 tons of TNT. This caused a crater one-third of a kilometer wide and transformed the sand at the launch site into a light green glass-like substance. The observers nine kilometers away did not hear the deafening noise of the shockwave until 40 seconds after the detonation, but by then, they were witnessing a growing fireball that transitioned in color from purple and green to orange and eventually white. It then condensed into a mushroom cloud spiraling 12 kilometers into the sky. The explosion's shock was felt nearly 100 kilometers away, and those at the observation shelters nine kilometers away later recalled, experiencing a brief period of intense heat as if they were momentarily standing in front of an open oven when the bomb detonated. Oppenheimer's alleged words during the Trinity test explosion have gained notoriety in modern times. It is said that he quoted from the Bhagavad Gita, a sacred Hindu text written in the first millennium BC, known as the Song by God. The Gita consists of 700 verses and primarily focuses on Prince Arjuna and his guide, the Hindu deity Krishna, discussing various moral and religious topics. It is commonly and mistakenly believed that Oppenheimer quoted a line from the Gita where the Hindu god Vishnu declares, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Although this line would have been fitting given the circumstances in New Mexico, Oppenheimer never actually said it. Instead, when reflecting on the event 20 years later, he mentioned another line from the Gita that resonated with him. It states, If the radiance of a thousand suns were to burst at once into the sky, that would be like the splendor of the Mighty One. In 1965, Oppenheimer believed this alternative line would have been more appropriate. Despite the myth that has emerged, Oppenheimer never uttered the words, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. However, it is worth noting that during that moment, the general reaction in the observation shelters was one of joy and celebration, as the Manhattan Project had achieved its goal. It was later observed that Oppenheimer was overjoyed with their success. However, the consequences of their achievement would soon become apparent. Within a few weeks of the Trinity test explosion, the atomic bomb was used as a weapon of war. Although the conflict in Europe had ended, the Empire of Japan showed no signs of surrendering, and it seemed that an invasion of the Japanese islands was necessary to end the war in the Pacific. The U.S. government feared that this could result in millions of deaths, as the Japanese were expected to fight to the end. As a result, President Harry Truman, who had taken office after President Roosevelt's death, decided to use the new atomic bomb as a demonstration to the Japanese government. On August 6, 1945, the city of Hiroshima was bombed with one of the Little Boy bombs. That evening in Los Alamos, Oppenheimer was elated and expressed regret that the weapon had not been available to use against the Nazis in Germany. However, the initial sentiment quickly transformed into disillusionment after three days when the United States deployed a second bomb, known as the Fat Man, on Nagasaki, Japan. Oppenheimer and his associates undoubtedly deemed this action unacceptable. It was evident that the Japanese had not been granted sufficient time to comprehend the consequences of the first bomb and decide to surrender, which they ultimately did six days after the Nagasaki bombing. Consequently, the war reached its conclusion. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki stand as the sole instances in world history where nuclear weapons were utilized in warfare thus rendering them highly contentious. Presently, the majority of analysts who examined the events of August 1945 
share the same perspective as Oppenheimer and his colleagues. They consider the use of the first bomb on Hiroshima somewhat justifiable, albeit deeply regrettable, as it served as a means to compel the Japanese to surrender and potentially averted a land invasion of the Japanese archipelago, thereby potentially saving millions of lives. However, most concur that the subsequent bombing of Nagasaki, a mere three days later, was unwarranted. Broader discussions have arisen regarding the ethical implications of the work conducted by Oppenheimer and his colleagues as part of the Manhattan Project during the war. This matter encompasses two perspectives. On one hand, the development of nuclear weapons has introduced an existential threat to humanity's survival in the modern era. On the other hand, the presence of nuclear deterrence has ensured that major conflicts have been avoided among the world's superpowers and large states since 1945. Europe's states had been engaged in continuous warfare for centuries. However, this changed when it became evident that engaging in direct conflict could lead to mutually assured destruction. Paradoxically, the development of nuclear weapons has contributed to a state of nuclear peace, although the risks remain significant in a world where politics are increasingly antagonistic and destabilized in the 21st century. Following the end of the war, Oppenheimer's reputation reached unprecedented heights within American academic circles. This presented him with new opportunities, leading him to leave Berkeley and assume the position of director at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, New Jersey, in 1947. This esteemed institution, which had notable figures such as Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, and Paul Dirac as former members, focused on the study of physics in the United States. Under Oppenheimer's guidance, it became a hub for emerging physicists. When Oppenheimer departed from Berkeley, several of his most promising graduate students also followed him to Princeton. In New Jersey, he continued to employ the methods he had developed in California during the 1930s, fostering an environment of lively discussions and research, often at the expense of his research. Oppenheimer deliberately chose to publish very little during his time at Princeton. Consequently, the Institute emerged as the leading center for the study of physics in the United States during the late 1940s and early 1950s. During Oppenheimer's tenure, the Institute saw the presence of numerous influential physicists who played a significant role in shaping the field during the latter half of the 20th century. One such physicist was Yoichiro Nambu, a Japanese-American, who later received the Nobel Prize in 2008 for his groundbreaking contribution to the discovery of spontaneous broken symmetry in subatomic physics. Another notable physicist was Murray Gell-Mann, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1969 for his remarkable work on elementary particles. In addition to his work at Princeton, Oppenheimer held various government positions from the late 1940s to the 1950s. He also possessed security clearance to access classified documents and materials related to the United States' evolving nuclear program. Of particular significance was his membership in the newly established Atomic Energy Commission, which was formed in 1947 under the leadership of the United Nations. This commission aimed to promote global peace in the aftermath of the war. The Energy Commission had the responsibility of regulating the spread of nuclear materials and the advancement of nuclear weaponry. Although the United States was initially the only country with access to nuclear bombs after 1945, it was inevitable that other nations would attempt to develop their weapons once they realized it was possible. In 1946 and 1947, Oppenheimer and his colleagues from the Manhattan Project played a crucial role in establishing restrictions on nuclear proliferation, which remain in effect today. As the first chairman of the commission, Oppenheimer tried to prevent a nuclear arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union during the emerging Cold War. However, his efforts were unsuccessful, and a significant arms race ensued after the Soviets successfully tested their first nuclear weapon in 1949. Upon learning of the Soviets' acquisition of a nuclear weapon, President Harry Truman's government began debating the development of a hydrogen or thermonuclear bomb which was far more powerful than the atomic bombs used in Japan. Oppenheimer and many other scientists who had contributed to the work at the Los Alamos laboratory were against this idea, arguing that such a weapon would cause immense damage and potentially trigger a nuclear war, 
leading to the destruction of life on Earth. In their petition to the government in late 1949, they emphasized that the risks associated with developing thermonuclear weapons far outweighed any potential military advantage. However, Truman pushed forward and approved the new program in January 1950. Almost three years later, in November 1952, the initial hydrogen bomb was tested on an atoll in the Pacific Ocean. Named Ivy Mike, the bomb generated an explosion equivalent to more than 10 million tons of TNT and was 450 times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped by the U.S. on Nagasaki in 1945. Despite the concerns expressed by Oppenheimer and numerous others, the Cold War was entering an era of mutually assured destruction. Despite his significant role in the Manhattan Project and his position as a senior government scientist for many years, Oppenheimer fell out of favor with the government in the early 1950s during the Second Red Scare. These were the years when the Cold War with the Soviet Union was intensifying, marked by the division of Germany into a Western-aligned West Germany and a Communist East Germany. The establishment of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the Warsaw Pact as rival military alliances and the Korean War, which served as a major proxy war between the Western and Communist blocs for the first time. America was engulfed in a period of heightened anxiety and suspicion due to legitimate concerns about Communist organizations operating within the country. Initially, these concerns were focused on the potential infiltration of Soviet sympathizers acting as a fifth column. However, this legitimate worry soon transformed into an irrational and baseless paranoia, extending to anyone associated with socialist politics or even organizations like the American Civil Liberties Union. This period, known as the Second Red Scare, was distinguished from the first Red Scare that occurred in the late 1910s after the Russian Revolution of 1917. The Second Red Scare gained momentum in the late 1940s and reached its peak between 1950 and 1954 when Senator Joseph McCarthy launched extensive efforts to identify and prosecute individuals suspected of having communist sympathies, no matter how tenuous the evidence. During this time, Oppenheimer himself came under suspicion. Oppenheimer had been involved with socialist and left-wing political movements, as well as civil liberties organizations in America since the mid-1930s. Although he had been largely apolitical in his youth, he began to take an interest in political affairs and joined various progressive movements. This was a time when socialist parties and organizations were seen as the natural opposition to the rising tide of fascism in Europe, particularly during the Spanish Civil War from 1936 onwards, when the Soviet Union and other communist parties supported the Republicans against the nationalists. It is worth noting, however, that Oppenheimer never officially joined the Communist Party of the United States. Nevertheless, many individuals close to him, including Jean Tatlock, with whom he had a romantic involvement from 1936 onwards, his wife Kitty, and his brother Frank, were active members of the party. Robert's involvement in various movements, including the American Civil Liberties Union, was considered radical during the 1930s and 1950s. However, these movements are now recognized as pioneers of the civil rights movement, which successfully ended segregation after almost a century. As a result, Robert Oppenheimer was viewed with suspicion by the authorities. This suspicion was further intensified by his father's German heritage, even though Oppenheimer's Jewish background would have made him an outcast to the Nazi regime in Berlin. Consequently, Oppenheimer was subjected to surveillance throughout America's participation in the Second World War despite his significant role in the Manhattan Project. These concerns culminated in 1949, when Oppenheimer was compelled to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee regarding his political affiliations. Although he acknowledged his connections to the Communist Party and the party membership of some of his prominent students at Berkeley, he maintained that he had never been a member himself. Initially, not much came of this interrogation. However, in early 1953, the accusations against Oppenheimer resurfaced, fueled by the misguided belief of the FBI that he was a Soviet operative within the United States. This unfounded suspicion reflected the prevailing paranoia during the Second Red Scare in America. In December 1953, Oppenheimer's security clearance was revoked by the U.S. government, prompting him to be advised to resign from his government positions. 
However, Oppenheimer refused to comply and instead requested a closed-door hearing, which took place in the late spring of 1954. During this hearing, his former colleague Edward Teller testified against him, casting doubt on Oppenheimer's behavior during his tenure as director of the Los Alamos Laboratory. As a result of this betrayal, Oppenheimer lost his security clearance and found himself isolated from the political and social sphere in the mid-1950s. The years that followed his security hearing and the revocation of his clearance were challenging for Oppenheimer. While most of his colleagues stood by him, the bureaucratic and administrative figures in American universities were less supportive, often canceling his scheduled lectures and appearances. This had a significant impact on Oppenheimer's confidence, leading him to refrain from actively participating in various initiatives, led by individuals like Einstein, that aimed to warn the government and American society about the dangers of excessive nuclear proliferation. Instead, Oppenheimer chose to spend more time outside the continental United States, eventually settling in the Virgin Islands, a U.S. overseas territory. He purchased an estate on Gibney Beach, which has since been colloquially referred to as Oppenheimer Beach. From 1957 onwards, he spent extended periods there, although he continued to receive invitations from various American institutions and organizations to deliver guest lectures. However, the 1950s proved to be a period of limited productivity for him in terms of research, as he published very little during this time. Towards the end of the 1950s, concerted efforts were being made to restore Oppenheimer's reputation on an international level. For example, in 1957, the French government honored him with the Légion d'honneur for his contributions to the Allied cause during the war. In 1962, he was made a foreign member of the Royal Society in Britain. By this time, there was a growing recognition in the United States that the Second Red Scare had unjustly targeted individuals who had only loosely associated with the American Communist movement and had no real ties to the Soviet Union. Consequently, in 1963, President John F. Kennedy took steps to rehabilitate Oppenheimer by presenting him with the Enrico Fermi Award. This award, established in 1956 by the U.S. Department of Energy and named after Enrico Fermi, the Italian-American scientist who played a key role in developing the world's first nuclear reactor in Chicago in 1942 as part of the Manhattan Project, had previously been given to several individuals who had worked under Oppenheimer at the Los Alamos Laboratory between 1943 and 1945. Notably, von Neumann, Beth, and Teller received the award in 1956, 1961, and 1962, respectively. Therefore, Oppenheimer's receipt of the award in 1963 was a belated yet significant recognition of the government's error in persecuting him during the Red Scare. Oppenheimer's reputation was only partially restored before his untimely death. Despite being awarded the Fermi Award in 1963, his reputation was still viewed with suspicion by many political figures. Unfortunately, Oppenheimer was diagnosed with throat cancer in 1965, which was likely caused by his lifelong smoking habit. Despite undergoing aggressive chemotherapy, he fell into a coma in early 1967 and passed away at home in Princeton on February 18 at the age of 62. At his funeral service, over 600 colleagues from academia, the scientific community, and the military paid their respects to Oppenheimer, demonstrating their respect for his contributions. His ashes were later scattered in the waters off St. John's Island in the Caribbean. In the years since his death, Oppenheimer's reputation has been fully rehabilitated, while those who testified against him, such as Edward Teller, were spurned by many in the scientific community. Although Oppenheimer was posthumously nominated for the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1967, he did not receive the accolade. There has been significant attention devoted to the reasons why he did not receive the Nobel Prize despite his extensive achievements, but there are clear explanations for this. Firstly, unlike Albert Einstein, who published over 300 scientific papers and numerous books, Oppenheimer did not have a prolific publication record. After the Second World War, he only published five academic papers. Additionally, although Oppenheimer made contributions to various fields within physics, 
He did not make a groundbreaking theoretical or applied discovery in any specific area that would have merited a Nobel Prize. The Nobel Prizes are typically awarded for specific scientific accomplishments rather than a lifetime of work. For example, Einstein received his Nobel Prize primarily for his work on the photoelectric effect. Therefore, Oppenheimer was not considered deserving of a Nobel Prize for his contributions to science, although some have speculated that his research on gravitational collapse could have been worthy of recognition. Throughout his career, Oppenheimer's main achievements were in collaborative work and leading teams of physicists and other scientists. This made him the ideal candidate to head the Los Alamos Laboratory during the war. Robert Oppenheimer is widely regarded as one of the most significant theoretical physicists in history. His research and work from the 1920s to the 1960s greatly advanced our understanding of the universe. Notably, his contributions to the Born-Oppenheimer approximation revolutionized our understanding of molecular dynamics starting in 1927, and his explanation of the Oppenheimer-Phillips process in 1935 enabled deuteron-induced nuclear reactions. However, his role as the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory during the Manhattan Project will forever be his most memorable accomplishment. Oppenheimer played a crucial role as the lead physicist in the U.S. efforts to develop an atomic bomb during the Second World War. Despite the ethical and moral implications of such weapons, the research was deemed necessary at the time. However, Oppenheimer was deeply troubled by the consequences of his work and spent much of his post-war years advocating against the development of more destructive weapons of mass destruction. Unfortunately, his opposition to the government's policies during the Second Red Scare led to his persecution and prosecution in the early 1950s. Nevertheless, Oppenheimer's legacy as a brilliant scientist and visionary thinker endures to this day. His unique perspective on the universe and his contributions to modern science make him a truly remarkable figure in history.